I've always said that the version of Batman that we see in Batman the Animated Series is the best version of Batman. Yes, he's even better than the comic book version. The reason I say this is that he was a compassionate protector that showed sympathy for his maladjusted foes. Just think about how many episodes of BTAS ended with the villain on their knees profusely weeping, with only Batman there to provide them with comfort before he took them away to Arkham Asylum for treatment. Over time and through the various DCAU shows, Batman's personality would change. He would become colder, more sullen. Briefly, he would become a respected leader within the Justice League. But by the time we see him in Batman Beyond, the show set some 40 to 50 years from now, whenever now is, Batman was a bitter recluse. How did he change from this compassionate protector to a angry, bitter old man? The question would never be fully answered, but the events of Batman Beyond Return of the Joker would go some way towards filling us in. Before I continue with the rest of the video, I just want to take a moment to plug Manly Bands, who have very kindly provided me with a 20% discount code for you viewers to use across their entire site. The main thing that attracted me to them is their very cool selection of officially licensed DC rings that are available to viewers in the US and Canada. They have designs inspired by Batman, Wonder Woman, Harley Quinn, Nightwing, Green Lantern, and a bunch of other DC characters, as well as rings that contain fragments of genuine fossilized dinosaur bones. If you are getting married, are already married, and to update your wedding band or you just want to buy some really cool rings head over to manlybands.com forward slash serum lake to get 20 percent off your order just make sure that the discount code serum lake is applied at the checkout and yes you can use this discount code on sale items to make even bigger savings thanks again to manly bands and with that out of the way let's get back to the video Let's kick things off by looking at how the character of Batman changed over time in the DCAU. As I've already said, in BTAS he's compassionate and warm-hearted. Note how he spends much of his time trying to save the twisted souls that threaten Gotham City. Batman always offers to help his villains, and if they refuse help, then he will bring them in one way or another. One of the many things that I've always enjoyed about this show is the way there's a very clear distinction between Batman and the public-facing version of Bruce Wayne. Hey, what's up, Doc? His general voice and demeanour are like completely different people. The more affable light tone of Bruce Wayne is the disguise, while the darker, more raspy whisper is his real voice. By the time we reach the new Batman adventures, Batman is more weary. Bruce Wayne still has a slightly different voice. It is a little softer, but there's less of a distinction between Batman and Bruce Wayne. You seem so grim. I've heard that said before. He still helps his villains, he stops Robin from killing Clayface in Growing Pains and goes out of his way to help Arnold Wesker get out from under Scarface, but he has clearly given up on some of them, most notably Two-Face. In BTAS, Batman never struck the mentally ill villains, except for the Joker, but in TNBA it wasn't unheard of for Batman to clobber his foes, regardless of their mental health. I'd argue that the biggest growth we saw in Batman's personality came during Justice League and Justice League Unlimited. Batman has always been a bit of a loner, working with Robin, Nightwing and Batgirl from time to time, but there was a very clear hierarchy in the team. Batman was always their boss. They were allowed to work with him because he permitted it. In the Justice League, he was a part-time member, someone that helped out when he had the time or if the threat was great enough. But the key thing is that they were a group of his peers, not his children. As such, we'd see Batman open up to his team members and over time he would embrace his role as a leader, particularly in Justice League Unlimited. He's completely comfortable surrounding himself with dozens of superpowered beings. So it was quite positive seeing Batman develop so much as a person, why Batman was even known to crack a smile every now and then. But by the time we get to the far-flung future world of Batman Beyond, the elderly Bruce Wayne has become a recluse. He spends almost all of his time in his mansion, rarely venturing out into the public eye. The only company he has is his loyal dog Ace, a direct nod to the campy 50s character Ace the Bat Hound, which I always found to be a nice touch. I'm a cat person and have never had much time for dogs, but I would take a bullet for Ace. He's a very good boy. We know from the opening of the first episode of Batman Beyond, Rebirth, that he had quit being Batman after he had had a heart attack while trying to rescue a hostage. In his weakened state, he pulled a gun on one of the kidnappers threatening to shoot him. The realization that he was reliant on a firearm, the kind of weapon that killed his parents, ruining his life by setting him on the path to become Batman clearly devastated him. However, there's another key factor shown to us in this opening section that is less discussed but I feel is equally as important. His company was taken from him. Derek Powers was successful in a hostile takeover of Wayne Industries. 
forming the new company Wayne Powers. Batman's reaction to having his family's company taken from him, essentially another key aspect of his life's work to make Gotham a better place, is to put on his costume and go rough up some kidnappers. It seems like no matter how old he is, Batman benefits from the healing power of punching some wrong'uns in the face. But in that single night, Batman lost the two most important things to him. His family company, which had been used for the betterment of Gotham City, and was his only real remaining connection to his deceased parents, and then his identity as Batman. Without them, who was he? When we next see him some 20 years later, Bruce stumbles upon Terry McGuinness being pursued by the Jokers. Despite his advanced age, Bruce makes short work of the clowns, but the physical exertion takes its toll on his body, and he needs some help getting home. After getting Bruce's heart medicine, Terry excuses himself, spots a bat in distress, and stumbles upon the Batcave. Bruce catches him, roughs him up a little bit, and then sends him on his way. And it's interesting that Bruce didn't actually do anything to protect his secret. Obviously, he wouldn't kill someone that had just wandered into the Batcave. Traditionally, he's recruited the people that learn his secret identity. But I find it strange that he didn't really act after Terry entered the Batcave. He just cast him out and went back to sitting by himself in the dark. A short time later, Terry comes back to Wayne Manor with evidence that Derek Powers is using Wayne Powers to create deadly chemical weapons and is selling them to foreign governments. This outrages Bruce, but he won't do anything about it directly. He instructs Terry to take the evidence to the police. Now, Terry tries to follow Bruce's orders, but Derek Powers gets to him first, leading to Terry fleeing for his life. Later, when Terry steals the Batman costume and tries to take in Powers himself, Bruce activates an override, which holds Terry in place as he's being assaulted. There's a brief moment where the possibility that Bruce is going to allow Terry to be beaten to death. He clearly knows that what he's doing is wrong. Yes, Terry stole his costume, but he did so for the right reason. Even Ace doesn't think Terry deserves the beating he's receiving. With a simple flip of the switch, Bruce goes from a reclusive billionaire to the mentor of the new Batman. And this is just the start of his rehabilitation. In the episode Disappearing Inc, we get a great example of how much Batman has grown since meeting Terry. Early in the episode, we're shown one of the methods Bruce had developed to potentially continue his mission as Batman, a large Iron Man-like suit of armour. However, wearing the armour put too much strain on his heart, so he put it in storage. When Inc returns and takes the younger Batman hostage, insisting that the elder Batman turns himself over to her or she'll kill him, we see Bruce face Inc without hesitation. And there's a wonderful moment where Shirley Walker's Batman theme is played with electronic instruments, and it's so damn cool. Now Ink is able to defeat Bruce, but the distraction he provided gives Terry enough time to break free. But it's informative to see how selfless Bruce Wayne was. He was more than willing to throw his own life away to protect Terry. In Sneak Peek, when the sleazy journalist Ian Peek smuggles a camera into the Batcave, Bruce goes to him. When he learns that Peek has been using a stolen experimental belt that allowed him to become intangible, equipment that had been developed by one of Bruce's scientists no less, Bruce becomes enraged. The lab containing that equipment had burned down years ago, killing its inventor, the implication being that Peek had murdered the scientist and set the place on fire to hide the evidence. When Peek starts to lose control of his tangibility and pleads with Bruce to help him, Bruce refuses, picking up the evidence of Batman's identity and walking away. This is a huge departure from the younger Bruce Wayne. As Batman, he would go out of his way to offer help to his foes. Just think of how he handled Two-Face, Clayface, or practically any other villain with a face. Elderly Bruce Wayne clearly thinks that some people just don't deserve his help, but those that he deems to be worthy, he would give his life for them. That's a particularly significant departure from how he was portrayed in Justice League as well. So what led to these changes? While we don't get a definitive answer, the film Batman Beyond Return of the Joker gives us some insight during the sequence that flashes back to Batman and the Joker's final confrontation. Now this is a big topic that probably deserves its own video, but I'll try to cover the main points. Robin was kidnapped by Harley and the Joker, who then torture him and brainwash him, making him become Little Jay. A nice bird name pun there. Jay is completely unhinged, his mind broken from weeks of torture and psychological abuse, which the Joker documents and plays for Batman. During this torture, Robin spills all of Batman's secrets, including his real name and primary motivations, much to the Joker's amusement. This scene is reminiscent of The Killing Joke, where the Joker shoots and violates Barbara Gordon and takes pictures to show her father Jim Gordon in an effort to drive him mad. Batman's response to these images and the revelation that the Joker now knows who he is 
looked pretty interesting. The scene where Batman bursts into the projector room through the window is psychologically revealing. He's clearly furious and anger is a secondary emotion, something we feel in response to another feeling. It's kind of like a defense mechanism. When we feel vulnerable or like life is spiraling out of control, we roar to try and scare off the bad stuff and regain some control. Batman's anger is expressed through a backhanded slap to the Joker's face. It's not an attack intended to cause lasting harm, more a loud noise and a short sharp sting. It's intended to demonstrate superiority over the Joker. You don't need to punch him. A single swipe with the back of the hand is all that's needed to show him who's boss. It's an act of disrespect. He then flings the Joker across the room as if he were nothing before stating that he's going to break him in two. We've never seen Batman like this before. Usually each blow is intended to take the opponent out of the fight. Batman rarely enjoys hurting people. He just does what he needs to do to take out aggressors but this time he drags it out. I have to think that Batman isn't acting this way because the Joker has found out his secret identity or that he's hurt by the Joker's taunts. I don't even think he's doing it to avenge Tim. No, he's reacting out of his own feelings of guilt. He was the one that brought Tim into the costumed vigilante life. Everything that happened to Tim from that point on was his responsibility. Guilt is one of the major driving emotions for Batman. He blamed himself for his parents passing, even though there was nothing he could have done to prevent it. He was just a boy. And the Joker has just heaped a ton more guilt onto Batman. The Joker is clearly no physical match for Batman, but the Joker has made him feel weak, placing him right back in that Gotham City alleyway one dark night, watching his parents laying in the filthy streets, drowning in their own blood. And he's furious. There's a second comic book storyline called Death in the Family where the Joker murders the second Robin, Jason Todd, and I feel that this section of Return of the Joker is an indirect version of that story. Except the Joker doesn't directly kill Robin, instead he kills a part of Batman and the concept of the Bat Family. Following the Joker's death at Robin's hands, Batman disbands the Bat Family and refuses to let Tim endanger himself again. Batgirl would go on to hang her cape and cowl up, instead focusing on her police work and eventually become the police commissioner. Tim would try to be a hero on his own, but would eventually give up and have a real life, and God knows where Nightwing is. Batman, meanwhile, would descend into despair, locking himself away from everyone that cared about him, gradually losing everything else that was important to him, until eventually he was just a broken old man sitting in a big old house with his mean dog. Until that fateful day that Terry McGuinness entered his life and Batman found himself on the road to recovery. And this is my absolute favourite thing about Batman Beyond. It's an idea that The Dark Knight Rises tried to explore when they opened the film with Batman having disappeared years ago and Bruce Wayne was moping around in his mansion. But I think Batman Beyond executed it far better. Batman's descent into isolation was gradual. It took a good 20 years before he would be forced to give up the costume and with nothing left, he sat at home and started to rot. I find this far more satisfying than Batman giving up his costumed identity because his girlfriend got blown up. Without the costume, Batman felt like he was nothing. But by helping Terry McGuinness through his pain and mentoring him, Batman would ultimately save himself too. Okay, that's the end of this week's essay and the end of my entire month of Batman Beyond content. I thought it was fitting to start with Terry and end on Old Man Bruce. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, tell all your friends about me because it really helps. If you really want to show your appreciation, I've enabled the thanks button. This will allow you to throw a buck or two my way to go towards improving the production quality of my videos. I also offer channel memberships for $1.99 a month. This will get you early access to my weekly video essays, irregular members only videos, custom emojis, priority responses to comments, and an icon on your profile identifying you as one of my people. Now, just because Batman Beyond Month is over, that doesn't mean I won't ever talk about the show or its characters again. If you would like me to add Batman Beyond characters into the rotation, let me know in the comments. I'm going to be back next week with a video looking at one of Batman's early villains that didn't appear in animation until the new Batman adventures. We're going to talk about Firefly. Hope to see you then.